Tonight on KQED Newsroom, the state is reopening its economy as vaccinations become available for more and more residents. Meanwhile, Democrats strengthen their support for Governor Gavin Newsom. Will it be enough to keep him in office? Our political pros weigh in. And did you know there's at least one planet for every star in the sky? Mother and daughter explorers Natalie and Natasha Battaglia share secrets they've learned from peering into space and where we might find life outside of planet Earth. Plus, a sneak peek inside KQED's headquarters, currently under construction, is this week's look at something beautiful. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. This is our last show for a few months, and it's another great one, so I'm glad you're with us. Let's start with a look at this week's news in California. On Thursday, the state expanded vaccine eligibility, so now anyone over 50 can receive the jab. That is, if they can get an appointment. Six million more Californians are now eligible, but supplies are still limited, so providers are asking us all to be patient. First Lady Jill Biden visited the Central Valley on Wednesday to support farm workers who have lobbied for priority access to the vaccine. The United Farm Workers wasn't only fighting for better wages, it's always been a moral movement, one of justice and humanity for all but especially for the agricultural workers who are mostly unseen. Rental prices in San Francisco have been trending upward and have now seen the highest increase since the start of the pandemic. Still, the median rental price is down more than 20 percent since last year. Baseball season opened on Thursday with the San Diego Padres, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the Oakland Athletics and the San Francisco Giants playing with fans in the stands once again. The A's just hired their first female announcer, 34-year-old Amelia Schimmel. And a new poll from the Public Policy Institute of California indicates Governor Gavin Newsom could beat back a recall if the election was held right now. 40% said they're in favor of kicking him out, but 56% said they'd vote to keep him in office. To chew on this week's big political stories, I'm joined now by San Francisco Chronicle senior political writer Joe Garofoli. Hi, Joe. Hey, how you doing? And Politico senior writer Carla Marinucci. Hi, Carla. Hey, Priya. <laughs> Good to be with you. Thanks for both of you being here. They both join us by Skype from Oakland. Carla, I want to start with you. You had a big scoop this week. You talked with Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. What did he have to say about the recall? Well, you know, Schwarzenegger captured lightning in a bottle back in 2003 with that recall. He, he was an unusual figure, the world's biggest uh, action hero at the time. So he talked about... Uh, Yes, that was an unusual circumstance, but there are some similarities, he said, with the movement today and the one in 2003. Voter dissatisfaction, anger, and something that has created the momentum. In that case, it was the blackout, the electricity mm -hmm. crisis of 2003. Today, he said, Gavin Newsom's French laundry incident, uh, which ramped up, you know, voter anger about hypocrisy. He said the people in... in the vo voters are angry about Sacramento being unconcerned with their own worries, uh, un unresponsive. And so had, it, had some advice for Newsom saying, look, you may have been slow coming out of the gate, but get out there. He, he praised Newsom for being out there, for doing vaccinations, for sort of getting California's business and schools back on track. He said he has to keep doing that. But this is not about party, Schwarzenegger warned. This is about the people's anger. Uh, and the politicians in Sacramento had better be uh, concerned about that. So, Carla, just to follow up on that a little bit, we are seeing some positive signs for Governor Newsom. Tell us about how the support is going for him and where it looks like the recall will land right now. Yeah, I mean, the the governor has gotten some good news in the past couple of weeks. Aside from the polls, look, the money is pouring into that anti-recall movement. He, he collected $3.1 million in the first two weeks his campaign did, uh, much, much of it from small donors, from almost 95% of it from Californians. So that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, another big, uh, I think, uh, advantage for Newsom now, uh, Democrat Tom Steyer has oh. said he's not going to get into the race. We reported that he was polling himself to see if he was an alternative. Look, if a Democrat gets in, it's going to be much, much more difficult for Newsom. So right now he is out. He's being vaccinated. He did that this week. Uh, and the vaccines, over 
18 million in California. That is good news for Newsom. Uh, a lot of people are saying if that continues, this recall attempt is going to be a very, very uh, big challenge, a heavy lift for the Republicans. And Joe, and it looks couple, like you want to join yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple other things that are that are uh, they're behind the, the Newsom that's helping him. Uh, that that same PPIC poll that came out that Carla's referring to, uh, it's, I think it's like 74 percent of Californians say the worst of the pandemic is behind them. So he keeps talking about the light at the end of the tunnel, and and many Californians are seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, his approval ratings have remained steady. You know, the 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 point of this recall is that he is a scapegoat. It, People were pissed off about, you know, closures and, and the whipsawing back and forth about what's open, what's closed. They, they uh, pinned it on Newsom, but uh, yet his approval rating is main steady. And the, and the, 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 of course, the main thing he's got going for him is there is no Arnold in this race. There's no there's no one with a hundred percent name recognition. Uh, literally, uh, Schwarzenegger back in the day had the same amount of name recognition as the Pope, and arguably better numbers. Um, so, but so he's, he's got those, that's what he has going for him. And, and this is, as Carla said, this is good news for Newsom this last week. Uh, or so. Although Schwarzenegger did say, it's still early. We could see somebody get into this race, a Clooney, a Brad Pitt, uh, a Meghan Markle. <laughs> Uh, as political reporters were saying, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, please jump in. Please jump in. A little drama to cover. All right. I hate to turn away from it, but let's go to the national stage. Joe, Vice President Kamala Harris has been put in charge of working on the immigration crisis. What's that going to look like, especially for us here in California? It, it's a uh, it's the toughest of assignments, and it's what makes it a little bit tougher for her is a couple of things. Number one, let's let's remember she does she has limited foreign policy experience. Uh, she's, she was a senator for about four years, or three years, really, and one of those she was running for president. So she didn't have, doesn't have as much overseas uh, experience, diplomatic experience. So this is going to be a little bit of learning on the job for her. The other thing is uh, she disagrees with Biden on mm. some uh, immigration policy. Uh, let's look at Title 42, for example. And I wrote about this in Sunday column uh, about a week or so ago. Um, she is, uh, Title 42 uh, um, is, is the public policy uh, public health uh, uh, provision that Donald Trump used to close the border. And so, uh, you know, part of that has been rescinded, but not all of it. It's still being used to keep uh, adult migrants out. Kamala Harris said this was an over, overreach of executive power when she was a senator and when Donald Trump was the president. Now that Joe Biden is the president, she doesn't say anything about it. Mm. Um, and so you remember, uh, Biden said that uh, Kamala Harris will be the last person in the room. Uh, with her, and we wonder if she's bringing this up to the president. And you know, Priya, we got to say there, there's a lot of pitfalls for Kamala Harris in this immigration portfolio. I mean, it's a no-win situation in a lot of ways, and Republicans are going to try and tie this around her neck and to damage her prospects coming up uh, in 2024, if, if then or 2028. Uh, I think it's interesting she's coming back to Oakland uh, next week to talk about something totally different, something she has probably more. Um, uh, positive uh, ratings on, and that is infrastructure. Everybody wants to talk infrastructure. Well, well that's so a good thing for her. As you know, Kamala Harris is supposed to be the last person in the room. Apart from immigration, Joe, does it seem like she's able to influence the White House policy towards some of those Californian ideals? Uh, the jury's out on, on this stuff. Let's, let's take a look at a couple of them. Let's look at weed. Uh, right. When she goes in and talks to the president about weed, and which is, seems odd to say, but she, they will be, uh, Kamala Harris is for uh, legalization of marijuana, uh, and, and she sees it as a, as a criminal justice issue. Uh, the, the president has, has never been there, and it isn't close to it at that point. Uh, and, they, and they also disagree on the filibuster. When she was on, uh, when candidate Harris said that uh, she was say, I'd like to get rid of the, the filibuster when it comes to the Green New Deal. Well, that's a mm -hmm. twofer. Uh, you know, right. because Biden does not support the Green New Deal, and Biden is, is he's warming up to, to sort of softening the filibuster, but he's not there yet. All right. Carla, there continue to be many incidents of violence against Asian American Pacific Islander people and protests against that violence. So how are communities and political leaders responding this week? Yeah, I mean, with, with 3,800 incidents reported over the last year, this has become, I mean, top of mind when you're seeing incidents from New York, Oakland, several incidents of elders there uh, in, in, in Chinatown. Look, uh, the Attorney General Rob Bonta, or the yeah, Attorney General to be Rob Bonta, uh, who is Filipino-American himself. I mean, 
He has made it clear this is going to be a priority for him here in California. And Governor Newsom has also been uh, very, very aggressive on this one. This is, this is an, uh, I think, an issue that is going to be a measure for a lot of voters out there. Those AAPI voters, very, very important mm -hmm. to both Democrats, to Newsom in this recall and every place else. So the fact is more awareness and now a lot more concern, a lot more action from the part of uh, public officials on AAPI violence. And Joe, let's come back to a topic we hit at the beginning, sort of this light at the end of the tunnel with COVID. There is a story I know you've been working on related to COVID and health care. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the things that was in, uh, in the, uh, that recent uh, PPIC poll was uh, how Californians, uh, almost 7, 8, and 10 now, support uh, giving uh, health care to undocumented immigrants, uh, you know, regardless of their status, of course. Um, uh, but also in there was that they were more willing to pay for more government services, uh, provided they got more, mm -hmm. as opposed to paying less for fewer. Uh, one of the things that the pandemic has done is 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 sort of open people up to how healthcare is a system. Look at we're, we're counting the number of uh, ICU beds, we're counting the number of ventilators. We're seeing this as a less of a commodity, as something you buy or can afford or can't afford, but something that we all benefit right. from. We're all look starting at the, to understand the, uh, the value of that in a new way, yeah. right? People people are so, are saying, well, maybe this is we should have a. Um, uh, this, for advocates of Medicare for all, are saying, well, this is a, an opening for us to talk about how. We should have one system that is accessible right. to, ev to everyone. We got to leave it there. Joe Garofoli with the San Francisco Chronicle, Carla Marinucci with Politico. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you. Is there life beyond Earth? How did we go from the Big Bang to the organized organic matter we see today? Our next guests tackle the biggest questions of the universe by peering through <laughs> immense telescopes into the farthest possible reaches of space. Astrophysicist and astrobiologist Natalie Battaglia studies exoplanets, that is, planets outside of our own solar system. When she began in the mid-90s, there were only a few known exoplanets. However, as a leader on the recent Kepler telescope mission, she and her team discovered more than 4,000 such planets, some of them potentially harboring life. Her daughter, Natasha Battaglia, is following in her mother's footsteps. She's a research scientist working for NASA on the James Webb Telescope Project, the largest telescope yet created, which is set to be launched into space this fall. Joining me now is Professor of Astrophysics and Director of Astrobiology at UC Santa Cruz, Natalie Battaglia. Hello, Natalie. Hello. And her daughter, NASA Ames Research Scientist, Natasha Battaglia. Hi, Natasha. Hi. Hi, Hi, nice to be here. And they both join us by Skype from Beaverton, Oregon, where they're visiting family with a new grand baby in the family. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Natalie, you have had an incredible career. Could you explain the Kepler mission to us and what you found? Kepler was NASA's first mission capable of finding potentially habitable Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars in the galaxy. And for the first time, we were able to detect not just one planet, but hundreds or even thousands. And over its eight-year lifetime, it actually discovered uh, something like 4,500 planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. And so from that data, we learned three very important things. First, we learned that on average, every single star in our galaxy harbors at least one planet. And the nearest potentially habitable planet is likely to be within like 10 light years. Uh, you know, us living in the United States, that would be like a planet at the corner grocery store, you know, very close. And we also learned that the diversity of planets in the solar or in the galaxy is much greater than the diversity of the planets that we see in our solar system. Mm. And you were measuring very minute changes in light. Can you describe the process of discovery? Yeah, Kepler finds planets indirectly. We don't take pictures of planets. What we do is we observe stars and we measure their brightnesses very, very precisely so that we can detect the minute diminutions of light that happen if a planet were to eclipse its parent star as it orbits. Those those diminutions are so small, the, the, the dimming of light due to an Earth-like planet orbiting a sun-like star 
is analogous to looking at a skyscraper, like the largest skyscraper in New York City, imagine, and it's nighttime and all the windows are open and the lights are on and one person goes to a window and lowers the blinds by about a half an inch. That's the dimming of light that Kepler had to be able to detect in order to find these planets. Fascinating. Natasha, you're now embarking on a new research project. Tell us about the James Webb Space Telescope you'll be working with and the focus of your particular research. Yeah, absolutely. So as my mom just explained, Kepler opened up this huge new field of exoplanet science. And now we can embark on this whole new journey of actually studying these planets in more depth. And so what Kepler taught us is basically just the size and the mass and maybe the approximate temperature of these planets. And with James Webb, we can actually go deeper and understand what their chemical compositions are, understand what their climates might be like. Um, one of the really incredible things that Kepler discovered was that one of the most common types of planets in the galaxy have no representation in our own solar system. These are planets that are a little bit bigger than our terrestrial planets, uh, but a little bit smaller than our gas giants. And so our program for uh, that we'll be studying with the James Webb Space Telescope is going to look at these what we call super Earths or sub Neptunes and trying to, for the first time, figure out what they actually are. And Natasha, could you describe the telescope for us? Yes. So the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, when it's all laid out, is fits on about the size of a tennis court. So it's very big. The mirrors, which you can see behind me, are uh, plated in gold beryllium. And it's it's not a lot. It's as uh, about the weight of a golf ball that's coated on that mirror. Um, the mirror is about uh, six and a half uh, meters big. And so it gives us a huge uh, light collecting power to actually be able to detect these planets. The other awesome thing about the James Webb Space Telescope is it looks into the infrared. And so with the Hubble Space Telescope, we were only looking at visible light. With the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll be able to see infrared light. Uh, a good analogy is thinking about uh, trying to look at a, a big forest through a crack in a gate. You know, we were kind of seeing blurry images and trying to make out what was going on. And with James Webb, we're going to be able to really open up the gate for the first time. And Natalie, you're also going to be working with the Webb Telescope Project, and that infrared capability is going to give us an opportunity to look back in time, almost to the beginning of the universe. What are you hoping we'll learn? Oh, my goodness. Um, of course, I have a lot of interest in what we're going to learn about the planets themselves and their climates and how atmospheres transition into the type of atmospheres that Earth has and what the implications are for life. But Webb, because it has a large collecting area, it can see deep into the universe. We will be able to reach back to the first 200 million years after the Big Bang. We will be able to see a phenomenon like the supernovae of the very, very first stars that were formed in the entire universe at a moment, at an epoch in time, when literally the lights were turned on for the first time in the universe. So it's tremendously exciting. That's just one example of the myriad science questions that Webb will be able to answer. And Natasha, the Webb telescope is not only the largest telescope ever to be built, it's also the most expensive. The price tag is about $9 billion. And we obviously have other needs for money here on Earth. So what is your argument for why we should spend money on space exploration? Yeah, when you, when you put a real number or price tag on it like that, it sounds like a lot of money. However, when you spread it out over the decades of development that have gone in into creating this immense technological feat, it really isn't that much. And as humans, it's, it, it really, uh, ex exploring the universe and pushing boundaries to new frontiers is really what makes us human. And so it is imperative that we continue doing projects like this pushing boundaries, exploring new new areas of, of space and other realms of science. Yeah, I, you know, you can't put a price tag on wonder mm -hmm. and, and the meaning that science gives to our life, or just knowledge, understanding our place in the universe. You know, Kepler found these potentially habitable planets and I think catalyzed the search for life beyond Earth in a very tangible way. And Webb is going to be the next step towards that eventual goal. And as we search for life, we have to study the limits of planetary habitability. 
When you do that, you learn something about the sustainability of life right here on planet Earth. So I think the search also makes us ultimately better planetary stewards, which, as you know, is so important today. So how do you put a price tag on that? How do you put a price tag on the unknown and the feeling of wonder and the inspiration that it gives to all of humanity? Well, Natasha, you and your mom are both featured in a new film called The Search for Planet B. Are you hoping to find a new planet that humans could inhabit? Well, I don't know if <laughs> um, one of the most exciting things that James Webb is going to do really early on is look at this incredibly interesting planetary system called the TRAPPIST-1 system. The TRAPPIST-1 has seven planets in its system, much like our own solar system. And three of those planets lie in what we call the habitable zone, which is this zone that could potentially harbor liquid water. And so we already have some examples of incredibly interesting systems where we can uh, search for potential signs of life. Natasha, if you'd like to add. Uh, well, I was just going to say that I think um, Nathaniel Kahn, the filmmaker, chose that title rather facetiously because every single person that he interviewed talked about the sustainability of life. And we are not finding other planets to have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. We're looking for life so that we will understand the sustainability of life on planet Earth. Um, and again, when you do that, um, that's the knowledge that you glean. So I think the search for planet B was a title that was chosen really facetiously in order to highlight that fact. Natalie, right? when you were coming up, there weren't many women in your world. You broke glass ceilings. Have you seen that change for your daughter's generation? Yes, uh, definitely. There has been change. You but sound that hesitant. Has, <laughs> but that change has been very slow. Um, you know, w w when Natasha started grad school, for example, she sent me a picture on my cell phone, like, oh, here's the freshman class. Here I am with my colleagues. And that picture just rang a bell with me because there's my daughter wearing this bright pink shirt surrounded by her male colleagues. And when I was a young intern, my very first science internship, we took a similar picture of the interns for that summer. And there I was in my bright fuchsia pink sweater surrounded by my male colleagues. So it just, I felt, man, 26 years have gone by and not much has changed. That felt very discouraging. Um, but there's a lot to be hopeful for. And the fact that Natasha is here and has persevered and is doing what she's doing, I think is partial evidence of that. Natasha, what do you feel are some of the obstacles that still hold young women back? Well, in, in the movie, I talk about one of those obstacles, which is there, there was a moment where my mom had me as a kid draw a picture of an, of an astronaut. And me, the daughter of a, a female scientist and also a Latinx scientist, both you know parts of marginalized communities, I drew this incredibly stereotypical image of an astronaut, this, you know, this white male. Hmm. And that really struck a chord with me, even as a, you know, a seven, 10 year old, that even with examples in my own life, I still had these really in-depth, you know, cultural stereotypes ingrained. And if I could fall victim to that, then certainly the broader population still has those deeply ingrained in their own as well. And so there's an identity crisis for sure um, that, you know, happens at such a young age for female and people of color. Well, your representation, both of you in your fields, absolutely will make a difference for generations going forward. Before we end, I'd like to ask you both, what is it like to work with your mother, to work with your daughter <laughs> on this project and in this field? Uh, Natalie, let's start oh, with I'm you. not going to lie. For me, it's like so incredible. I love it. It's so fantastic to have this in common with my own daughter and to sit there and talk about work and to be here with her is just for me is like a dream. It's like a mom's dream, right? That's wonderful. And Natasha? It is It is coming up in the field. It is so amazing to have a support system, especially as someone who's part of a marginalized group, to have a role model, you know, in your, in your, that you can text at any time is incredible. Um, it's going to make me cry. <laughs> um, doing these interviews like this are the, the hardest part, I think, because we just want to sit and laugh. <laughs>
<laughs> well, we wish you both well, and we're looking forward to hearing about the results of the research that you have to do in the future as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. Natasha and Natalie Vitalia, Space Explorers. <laughs> As I mentioned at the top of the show, this is our last production for a few months. KQED Newsroom is going to be on a temporary hiatus as we prepare to move back into our headquarters, which are being renovated right now. That means we'll be off air after tonight through the end of July. We'll be back in August. For this week's look at Something Beautiful, we bring you images of our building as it undergoes renovation. We've got some architectural renderings of the new design, as well as footage of the construction in progress from this week. I hope you enjoyed this exciting glimpse of what's to come. In addition to updated television and radio studios, the building will have a community events space. And when it's safe, we hope you'll join us in person. Thank you so much to all of you who wrote in to protest our short hiatus. We will miss you too, and we can't wait to be together again in August. I'm Priya David Clemens. You can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. You can find more of our news coverage at kqed.org newsroom. From all of us here at KQED Newsroom, Thank you once again for joining us. Good night.